Okay, welcome everyone to WSO2 Summit and specifically uh, to my session. Uh, so as uh, Ishi mentioned, um, uh, this session is about uh, the service architecture, which I authored in uh, summer 2018 and went through many iterations. And um, in, I think the fourth uh, uh, iteration I released uh, so how will this will connect to the uh, topic here because we were talking about apis api supply chain and how you can utilize apis on your application development so uh, this can use as an architecture pattern to achieve uh, your objectives so during next uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, what i am planning to do explain uh, why we created a new pattern as well as um, how we created this pattern as well as what it is so basically, uh, uh, why, and, and like you might be wondering as well, why we need a new architecture pattern because uh, the uh, microservices architecture is well established uh, in uh, today's uh, modern uh, technology between uh, modern technology uh, uh, folks, as well as uh, the layered architecture used uh, many years and then uh, cloud native architecture coming into the picture. Uh, but uh, uh, by considering all these uh, existing architecture patterns as well as uh, the market need, uh, we uh, thought of uh, introduce something new. So the motivation behind this, we identified there's a mismatch between the existing architecture patterns and what exactly architects are looking at. So the first uh, reason for this, um, most of the existing architecture patterns are centralized and layered. Uh, so there's an issue with that uh, because when you have this layered architecture and controlled by a centralized team, uh, the layers are creating gates and gates are blocking the flow. And if you are into more agile based development, uh, the layered architecture doesn't fully support it and it uh, kind of uh, ignore uh, the basic agile principles. Uh, so you will be not get the uh, full benefits out of uh, the uh, agile uh, uh, methodologies. Give me a second, there's a pop-up uh, came in. I need to close it. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was the first uh, motivation we had. And the second motivation, like if you look at uh, and talk to many architects, they draw nice uh, architecture diagrams and those architecture diagrams are well aligned and using modern technologies uh, and looks like uh, what you see in the picture. But if you dig in deep and try to understand what exactly the enterprise architecture looks like it looks like this because uh, it is not that clean as we expected in the previous slide uh, so the reason behind this we have a lot of data systems subsystems we uh, purchased and built during last two decades and still we need those data and systems to do day-to-day -day business so we can't like completely build a, a greenfield system by ignoring uh, this data that we collected uh, for decades. Uh, so the, the uh, so that's the reality of the enterprise and uh, we need to address that. Uh, so then basically what uh, uh, I want to highlight here, uh, the most of the enterprises, uh, they have both uh, sides like the brownfield and greenfield. And in reality, the brownfield is more than uh, the greenfield. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, address both uh, these to spectrums. But existing architecture patterns are mainly focusing on either brownfield or greenfield. Uh, so we thought of we have to address both sides of this um, particular uh, problem. And then uh, when we did this research, we identified the reference architectures available online are not reference architectures per se, uh, those are reference implementations. Why I claim it like that, the reference architectures available either focusing on a specific technology or the um, 
uh, it is focusing on uh, how you build a system using a specific vendor uh, based technology so those are biased to a specific vendor or a specific technology so we thought of uh, when building uh, the reference architecture it has to be completely technology neutral as well as a vendor neutral then the uh, the next motivation we had uh, the current architecture uh, patterns are not supporting to bring new technologies once you build the uh, application systems using uh, the particular architecture pattern and move it to production systems but as an architect or a, a technology enthusiastic you would like to uh, uh, bring new technologies into the system and improve uh, the functionality performance and uh, the uh, flexibility of the system but it doesn't support so we thought of uh, the architecture pattern should have that flexibility for you to bring new technologies without affecting the current systems uh, like while you are uh, business as usual you should be able to update the systems without any issue then the next uh, motivation was uh, like there's a gap in between the architecture development and deployment or uh, between the architect developer and the devops engineer uh, because there's no common language or common thing that you can take it from uh, the architecture phase into the development and then deploy into your infrastructure so we thought of uh, address this as well uh, and uh, there should be something that you can uh, architect and then develop based on that particular architecture and deploy as it is without changing the design you did. Then the uh, microservices and latest uh, decentralized architecture uh, approaches uh, bringing a lot of complexity. And uh, I think you have seen this diagram. It's a very popular diagram about Uber uh, microservices architecture. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of moving parts in this. And uh, when you have uh, the decentralization and then uh, the uh, a lot of uh, microservices, it looks like this. And you need some dependency management while you are giving more and more flexibility for your developers to build these independent services in your infrastructure. So those are the uh, those were the the you know, motivation factors that we had. Uh, so before jumping to the particular architecture pattern, let's look at um, a little bit of the history and how uh, these architecture patterns patterns evolved during the last two decades. So the architecture started with the monolith applications that uh, the entire uh, the user interfaces, business logic, and data bundled together. And with the advancement of the data technologies, uh, the uh, the 2T architecture came into the picture and uh, moved the user interfaces and business logic uh, from the data layer. And then the 3T architecture, the most interesting era came after that around uh, 90s, that the user interfaces, business logic data are moving to three layers. Uh, and there were sub patterns came with that, like model view controller, model view controller two, then enhance it with the service oriented architecture by wrapping the business logic with services and APIs. And there were sub patterns of uh, service oriented architecture, like event driven architecture, web oriented architecture, and uh, it moved into more. Uh, microservices based architecture patterns in uh, modern world. So what I want to highlight here, it started with uh, the uh, layered architectures and then move into more segmented based approach. So this is an architecture diagram that I introduced around 2012. Um, uh, it is a layered architecture, but little different from a traditional layered architecture. It's a two dimensional view not like a, a single dimensional stack that uh, you will see in most of the layered architecture diagrams. Uh, we introduced uh, the functional capabilities as well as uh, the uh, life cycle of an application into the same uh, uh, diagram uh, to cover uh, an end-to-end -end life cycle of an API. And then we use system of systems concepts while uh, building this. And it was a very useful diagram those days, even uh, the architects heavily using this pattern in uh, modern world as well. 
So uh, we build systems using this uh, architecture pattern, but uh, in 2012, there was an eye opener for us. Uh, one system that uh, we built, uh, which followed uh, agile principles and they had uh, uh, agile teams, but uh, that project went into production after three years due to some reason. So we investigated what uh, was the reason behind that. Uh, then we found even they were following agile principles, the architecture was not agile enough to uh, support them uh, to get the production uh, system uh, in a shorter interval, like uh, three months or uh, less than uh, three years as they uh, went, uh, finally went into production. So we thought of we need to address this and uh, need to define a new architecture pattern. And we were experimenting about this thing for a while. Same time, microservices came into the picture uh, as a production-ready architecture pattern in late 2012, and uh, uh, organizations like Netflix, Uber, eBay, and uh, eBay uh, started using this thing, but uh, we found a common uh, uh, thing across these organizations as well. Even uh, it was a, a pure microservices architecture that they used to follow, there was a layer put on top of the microservices. So Netflix called it as APIs, and Uber called them as edge gateways, and eBay used this pattern called API facade. Even Gartner introduced uh, something called mini services on top of the core microservices to address the same problem. And if you can remember those days, uh, the architecture uh, diagrams uh, look like this. The microservices were stacked in another layer in the typical layered architecture. So it was another uh, form of the uh, layered architecture uh, didn't move out from that uh, drastically. And we identified a few of our customers improve this thing uh, by moving to a more segmented architecture, by categorizing uh, these uh, services based on the business unit or a specific uh, functional group. And they started building uh, more uh, flexibility and agility uh, into the systems. And some of the customers, they uh, use this pattern called platform of platforms that they deploy the entire stack uh, uh, per each business unit uh, that they had a better control and agility um, within that particular business unit or the agile team. But some of the functionalities like user stores and CICD processes were common uh, services that they shared across the business units, but still it was a layered architecture and uh, we couldn't achieve what we were uh, looking at at that point. So we hit a dead end and we thought of we have to start this from scratch. So what we did, uh, we started doing a lot of uh, research and uh, we narrowed down our research into four areas. We uh, look at the quantum computing and there were really good uh, concepts came from Kubernetes about decentralization. And interestingly, we looked at uh, biology and system biology as well, because there were some good uh, concepts uh, coming from uh, biology and system biology that directly addressing uh, the, uh, uh, in the architecture that we were looking to uh, build. At the same time, uh, we looked at uh, the gap between the business and technical services as well. Uh, so we identify some interesting things. Now, if you look at uh, so the definition, technical definition of a service, it's just a, a bunch of code annotated uh, and provide an interface that you can access it through uh, a, a network, basically. It's a, a network accessible endpoint that creates based on some uh, code. Now, if you look at the code, it's not a big difference that you will see uh, normal business logic and then you annotate it and make a service. But business is expecting something completely different. They don't care how you build a service. Uh, they look at some kind of a, a solution for a business problem. And when you try to provide a solution to your business problem, you need to combine these services. And that's where the uh, composite services and gateways came into the picture. So same thing apply for uh, microservices as well. So you use uh, the concept of scope uh, 
not the size, because a lot of people think it's a size that you are writing small services to make it micro, but that is not the uh, correct way of doing it. It's basically based on the scope. You divide your uh, the large or the monolith service into multiple services. But if you look at the code, it uh, looks similar to the, uh, the original service that I showed you. Uh, you just write some code and then annotate it, and it will create a service for you. Again, the business definition of a microservice doesn't change from a normal service. Business is looking for some kind of a business capability out of your microservices. So you have to combine these microservices and provide a business capability out of it. So you need to still put a gateway on top of the, uh, the microservices or uh, write the composite service. So then uh, the, the concept behind this, you need to group these services. So the grouping of the services, we call this group as a cell, and then the top gateway, we call it as a cell gateway. So that is how the concept started and linked to the uh, biology as well. So the, the why we took the biology concepts, because uh, the biology, uh, biological unit is uh, the one built everything that we see uh, in the world today. So we thought of uh, uh, enterprise architecture uh, has the same concept and uh, we stick to that uh, while uh, making this as a uh, typical architecture pattern. So let's uh, dig in deep into the uh, architecture pattern and the atomic uh, component of this architecture pattern, we call it as a component. So component can be any runtime that runs in your infrastructure. It can be a database, it can be a service, it can be a microservice, it can be a gateway, it can be a message broker. Uh, anything that you run in your infrastructure, we treat as a component. And the collection of uh, uh, these components, we call it as a cell. A uh, cell contains a cell gateway and then it has a boundary. And within that uh, cell boundary, you have multiple components running. Then the combination of the cell to the component can vary. In most cases, it can be a one to many, that one cell contains many uh, components. And in some cases, it can be one to one. As example, if you are running a, uh, identity component, or if you are running a, a message broker, or if you are running a, uh, a database, it can be one to one, that one cell contains only one component. So uh, the cells required to connect inside the cell as well as uh, out uh, between the cells as well. So we are using this uh, generic concept uh, called uh, a control plane, data plane, and a management plane. And um, using these three concepts that uh, we uh, are making this communication in between the components as well as the, uh, uh, the uh, between the cells as well. Uh, so then the... Uh, Inter and intra cell communication we discussed earlier. So uh, there's a, a control plane and a data plane local to the cell uh, that we call as the uh, local mesh. And there's a control plane, data plane, and a management plane global to all the cells that we call it as a global mesh. Now, if you are familiar with this uh, service mesh concept, uh, the uh, this is more than that. This is service mesh plus plus because it has a local mesh and a global mesh too. The communication to a cell that uh, there are a bunch of rules here. Uh, any ingress call that is basically the incoming traffic to a cell should come through the cell gateway. Uh, but uh, egress calls or the communication going out from the cell uh, can use multiple uh, cloud native patterns like a sidecar pattern or adapter or ambassador, and then hit the, uh, uh, the another gateway of uh, another cell uh, for the communication. So the, the one rule that I highlighted here, it's basically uh, using the, uh, the gateway pattern and then hit the, uh, the uh, another gateway in other uh, cell. So this is a API first architecture as I highlighted earlier. Uh, so why I claim that if you look at the communication uh, between the component, it will uh, happen through some kind of an API. And if the uh, and the communication between two cells will happen through a, uh, another API. And it's not only uh, the RESTful APIs uh, uh, 
uh, you have the flexibility to use um, different kind of APIs. Uh, so how I categorize them basically have full APIs that is basically RESTful APIs using HTTP and gRPC type of protocols and then push APIs uh, into two types like events using JMS, AMQP, SMTP type of protocols and streaming uh, protocols like Kafka and MQTT. Uh, then the, uh, uh, as I highlighted earlier, this is using the gateway pattern that will provide a lot of flexibility for us that uh, since the entire ingress flow goes through the gateway, we can enforce uh, the uh, policies at the gateway level as well as we can enforce observability at the gateway as well. And the security of the cell is a really important thing. Uh, that it can use two patterns. First thing is a self-contained pattern that uh, uh, within the local control plane, there will be a security token service that provide all the, uh, that will make all the decisions for the authorization, authentication and entitlement. But uh, in the second pattern, uh, the local control plane will go to the global control plane and get any additional information required to make this uh, security decision. So both are viable. And to optimize the uh, pattern two, you can cache some of the uh, decisions that you make uh, in the uh, global control plane and uh, make it more, uh, I mean, uh, make the performance really high. Then the, uh, the developer flow of this uh, concept, basically a developer will create a new cell or they can, if the microservices are existing, they can uh, create cells out of the existing microservices. Uh, they can update an ex existing cell or they can create a new version of the cell as well. That's totally depending on what type of uh, infrastructure that you are using to deploy uh, your uh, applications. And the developer will not see a difference he or she will use the same thing that they do in a usual developer flow that they will build uh, they, will, they will write the code, they will build it, they will commit it, they will test it, and they will push uh, it to uh, the uh, remote repo. And the CI CD process will either deploy an entire cell or deploy uh, a component inside the cell. And if you are into more container based environment, you will uh, deploy the entire cell rather than you update uh, a specific component. So this will create. Uh, more flexibility for you and then uh, uh, the cell will contain a version as well as uh, a component will contain a version as well uh, that will provide a lot of flexibility for you and we call it as the structured agility that you will get uh, three levels of agility than normal uh, enterprise architecture that you will have agility at the component level and you will have the agility at the uh, cell level and you will have the agility at the enterprise architecture level as well, based on the versioning mechanism as well as dependency management uh, techniques that we are using here. If you look at the uh, enterprise architecture, uh, this is how we envision it. The entire enterprise will be filled with different type of cells. And uh, we categorize these cells into a uh, few uh, categories. The first thing is the logic cells that uh, those are basically the services. And then you might have integration cells, legacy cells, external cells, uh, so on and so forth. So these are the identified cells at the moment, but you can introduce a various other type of cells as well. And this is an example that I'm not going to dig in deep into this. I'll share the slides and you can take a look. And uh, I claim that this is a vendor and technology neutral architecture uh, to verify that. This is a reference implementation of that uh, previous slide. And as you see, you can use various technologies to build this particular architecture pattern. And this connects with the team agility as well. Uh, and I would say it's a very human centric uh, architecture uh, that uh, it can connect uh, to the agile teams that uh, I call it as a, a self-organized team, a cell can uh, owned by a single team uh, and one team can own multiple cells but uh, multiple teams can't own a single cell that's a rule that we have 
define. And if you are interested about this uh, particular concept, you can read this uh, paper that I published about the cellular enterprise. And if you need to read more about the architecture pattern, this is a, a, a article published by a third party uh, author in uh, Nordic APIs, and you can refer that as well. Then uh, since you are introducing a new cell, you might need to justify this to your business. Uh, there are a bunch of ways that you can do. First thing is you can identify the flow efficiency uh, because uh, now there's more agility. The wait time will be less and the productive time will be high. As a result, the flow efficiency will be uh, improved. And there are other factors like mean time to repair, mean time to detect. Uh, those are really good examples and the given link provide you more insight uh, into that uh, that you can uh, take a look. So to summarize, um, a cell is a self-contained unit and you can deploy it um, as an independent unit and you can uh, scale it uh, without uh, depending on other cells and it contains a local data and a control plane. And as a cell-based architecture, it's a decentralized microservices friendly and a cloud native compliant. Uh, it's technology neutral, human centric, and you can build APIs as a product using uh, a cell uh, that uh, the concept that no one explained in the previous session. So we contributed to this concept in various ways. Uh, so we have the reference architecture paper uh, released under Creative Commons. So feel free to uh, send a PR and uh, provide your suggestions. And if you think the architecture document is useful, give us a good start. And as an implementation plan, I have authored another thing called a reference methodology in this particular URL. And you can use WSO2 technologies to build this architecture pattern as components, as well as the integration um, uh, supporting language that we introduced called Ballerina can use uh, as a way to build uh, network friendly programs and Ballerina can be a uh, candidate to build some of these uh, components as well. So if you are interested about this uh, concept and want to convert your current architecture into uh, this decentralized architecture, we can certainly help. You can simply uh, fill a contact us form. And if you want to get some uh, structured consultancy, we can provide it uh, under the strategic consultancy uh, we have. And you can contact me via email or uh, you can uh, use uh, connect me through LinkedIn and follow me uh, using the uh, uh, my Twitter handler. 